four things govern electromagnetism, right? Now, in more or less order, because we've been talking about what happens. I'm not going to bring it over in front of the camera because that breaks up. But you got the Helmholtz coils. You got two leads from the generator, the Helmholtz coil. And then we've got another set of coil inside the Helmholtz coils, and that's connected to microamine. So that when we change the make, change the uh, potential difference across the Helmholtz coils, you're going to change the magnetic field produced by those coils, which is going to change the magnetic field inside that smaller coil, which ought to produce an electric current that we can detect with a microammeter. But we can't detect it with a microammeter because either the microammeter is broken or because the current's too low. Now we could easily enough calculate what we think the magnetic field would be. We're getting on the order of a tenth of an amp through the coils and they have the diameter and everything. Uh, but we want to get the conceptual picture of everything from the generator to the coils. So what happens? And you know, reason uh, most of this out, okay? The thing that's missing is this picture of these four relationships. Okay, you're not, you're, you're, you're seeing the, 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 the trees, but you're not quite seeing the forest, but you're close. This is your organizing principle. Coulomb's law, biohazard Coulomb's law, okay? Force between two charges. Uh, and of course that leads you to a definition of electric field, but that's peripheral, okay? It's something that comes out of this. You just say, okay, well, now what's the force per unit of charge? So you call one of these a test charge, you divide it out, then you get the for force per unit charge, okay? Then you generalize that to electric fields created by collections of charges and all that stuff. But it all comes back to this. And then Gauss's law can be very helpful in situations involving appropriate symmetry, okay? And that's kind of where we started, okay? Now, first question I asked here was, uh, you know, ask what's going on here and, and get, getting answers like, well, there's a voltage running through the wires. Well, no, voltage is between here and here. There is a potential difference, which is a voltage, not a length of voltage, okay? Uh, potential difference is measured in volts, okay? Uh, and EMF is measured in volts. So we want to be clear about all that. Uh, we want to see that the potential difference between the two ends of this long wire that forms these two coils, or two loops, whatever you call them, um, is a result of the EMF or voltage. And everybody knew, you know, okay, yeah, you divide the EMF by the length of the wire and you get the electric field, okay? Got that pretty quickly. A lot, a lot of bits and pieces in this whole analysis. Uh, asked where the uh, voltage comes from, though. and nobody was telling me. I, I, okay, what I was hearing was okay, you're rotating a coil in a magnetic field and you're cranking it. Okay, okay, well, how does that create a magnetic field? Well, it comes down to your EMF is the rate of change of your magnetic flux. <laughs> I'll be around. Thank you. And uh, so yeah, that's the rate of change of magnetic flux and, and, and that goes into the generator. I think everybody has that picture. If you can focus on EMF as the rate of change of flux. But that took a while because people weren't getting that. People weren't seeing that. One of the four fundamental things you know. Okay. Everything else follows from it. Again, these are organizing principles that allow you to think through the whole thing. Okay. Now, people were also quoting these two rules that you know, moving charge in a magnetic field or a uh, uh, or a current moving in a length of wire, okay? Reacting with a magnetic field is your force, okay? And then you have this law, which tells you the magnetic field produced by a moving charge or produced by a current segment. Now this leads to integrals and 
all kinds of things, okay? Uh, in different configurations. You know, it's a magnetic field of a loop of charge. It's a magnetic dipole, okay? But it all comes out from all this, okay? It all comes out from these laws. And again, when you think about these things, think about them in the context of the four laws, and it'll help you pull it together. Now, uh, So when you, when, when, when you think about these coils, you don't want to think about some vague voltage going through all this length. You want to think about an electric field produced by the potential difference that's produced as a greater change of flux, okay, in that generator. Or if it's produced chemically in a battery, okay, well, like that I can do too, um, or by some other means okay uh could be by coulomb's law you know it could be a collection of charges that create an electric field uh, you know the static electricity pulse whatever uh okay the emf creates an electric field it creates a voltage that results in an electric field through the wire that accelerates the electrons which then don't get very far because there's a bunch of electrons, just like a cloud. So you end up with an electron drift in the way that we've described, uh, and that's your current. And your current then produces a magnetic field. Okay, every little segment of that wire produces a magnetic field. They all reinforce. We went through all the details of that, so we're doing, uh, and creates a magnetic field in that loop. Now we haven't analyzed how the magnetic field varies from the center of each of those loops, okay? Uh, so that we don't really have a handle on how the magnetic field in the middle of the Helmholtz coils changes in space over, you know, a small, small region, <laughs> okay? And then we got that little coil, okay? That little coil goes into that magnetic field. What happens in that little coil? Well, if you're changing the EMF by cranking faster or slower, reversing the cranking, you have a change in flux within that smaller coil because the Helmholtz coils create a magnetic field, maybe goes in this direction. And the smaller coil is oriented with the axis in this direction. So the magnetic field within that coil changes. And when that magnetic field changes, it produces an EMF in the coil. Now, the EMF doesn't do anything if you don't have a complete circuit, okay? But if you complete the circuit by hooking the ends of the coil, okay, to ammeter, you ought to get a measurable circuit a measure of current because of all the other stuff. So seeing the whole picture. Just like you got a coil between these guys. Electric you've got a current running this way. This coil, current running this way, this coil, a smaller coil, and a magnetic field in here, you start changing the EMF, it changes the direction of the current, the electric field, uh, and the wire changes, the acceleration of the electrons changes, all that happens. And you get the changing flux here that you then measure with the Okay. You get a change in flux here, it creates an EMF that creates a current that you then measure with the meter. If you put all that together, you've got a fairly good understanding of how these four laws behave in at least this situation, which gives you more insight into all the stuff that's been developed so far. Okay. <clears throat>